It is the true believer's ability to shut his eyes and stop his ears to facts that do not deserve to be either seen or heard, which is the source of his unequaled fortitude and constancy. He cannot be frightened by danger, nor disheartened by obstacle, nor baffled by contradictions, because he denies their existence. Eric Hoffer, The True Believer. Welcome back. Let's continue our journey with the valiant Hidalgo and his calculating squire. Recalling Andres' suffering at the hands of Aldudo and Don Quixote's penance in the Sierra Morena, Sancho now strips naked from the waist up and begins to lash himself. Hilariously, he immediately wants a raise. Sancho had probably given himself around six or eight lashes when the joke started to seem burdensome and its price rather low. And stopping a while, he said to his master that he considered himself defrauded because each of those lashes deserved to be paid with half a real, not a quarter. Don Quixote immediately agrees. I double the price in play. Now, Cervantes pushes the case further by having Sancho trick his master by whipping trees instead of himself. At this point, Don Quixote is so moved by his squire's sufferings that he begs him to stop. Note the Apollian overtones. On your life, friend, let this business go no further, for this medicine seems very harsh to me. For the ass, in vulgar discourse, suffers the load, but not the overload. Don Quixote intervenes, grabbing the twisted halter which Sancho was using as a whip. He said, let not fate allow Sancho, my friend, that you should lose your life on my account. Don Quixote insists they postpone their business. What business is this? On the one hand, paying someone for nothing but their pain sounds like the Marxist nightmare of capitalist exploitation. On the other hand, accepting payment for fake work sounds like the capitalist nightmare of a society ruled by workers. These contrasting perspectives on the employer-employee relationship move between visions in which both figures are victims of each other. Is there a middle ground somewhere here? Suggesting the answer, our heroes now arrive at the novel's seventh inn. Surely, it is significant that the narrator tells us that Don Quixote recognizes that it is not a castle. In their room hang two cheap paintings of the most important amorous scenes of Homer's Iliad and Virgil's Aeneid, the kidnapping of Helen by Paris and the suicide of Dido after Aeneas's departure. The narrator points out that Don Quixote notes that Helen goes willingly. She did not go against her will, and that Dido's suffering is overblown. She seemed to shed tears the size of walnuts from her eyes. After Don Quixote observes that by simply killing Paris, he could have avoided the destruction of both Troy and Carthage, Sancho wagers that before long, there won't be a tavern, an inn, lodge, or barber shop where the history of our deeds won't be seen in paintings. Although he hilariously hastens to add that he hopes the artist will do a much better job. Did you know? According to the father of history, Heliodorus, in his Historia, Helen went with Paris according to her own free will. In other words, Cervantes compares his art of the novel to these inadequate paintings of the great epics of Greece and Rome. What makes Cervantes' novel such a unique and modern version of classical epic? Many of the answers are to be found in this scene. Its realism, its commercial themes and locales, and its comical dialogues. Also, Cervantes' novel turns definitively away from military adventurism. Thus, even though Sancho wanted to conclude the business quickly, Don Quixote observes somberly that we have to save this for our village. Chapter 71's slap at bad paintings alludes to Avianeta's apocryphal continuation. 
How do we know this? Because chapter 72 involves an explicit encounter with Avellaneda's novel. Make no mistake, this is wild and crazy stuff. Cervantes has his fictional character, Don Quixote, strike up a conversation with one of Avellaneda's fictional characters, Don Álvaro Tarfe. Tarfe is headed to Granada, and he relates that he met and befriended a man named Don Quixote, accompanied him to the jousts of Zaragoza, and then left him in an insane asylum in Toledo. But Don Quixote convinces Tarfe that he is the real Don Quixote. The contrast hints at morality, as our Don Quixote is referred to as the good and Avellaneda's as the bad. Sancho enters the discussion as well, observing that the other Sancho is not nearly as witty or funny as he is. Don Quixote declares that he has never set foot in Zaragoza and that he much prefers Barcelona as a more beautiful and cosmopolitan city. Finally, Don Quixote gets Tarfe to sign an affidavit in which he declares that Don Quixote and Sancho are who they say they are and not those found in Avellaneda's novel. Notice how radically meta-literary this all is. Tarfe confirms that he has not seen what he has seen and that he has not experienced what he has experienced. Again, I say and affirm that I have not seen what I have seen nor did what happened to me happen to me. The contractual legalistic language here is also very intense, as is the presence of a bailiff and a scribe who faithfully record Tarfe's testimony. After leaving the inn, Don Quixote and Sancho celebrate their formalized victory over Tarfe and Avellaneda. How wise it had been to take his deposition before a magistrate. Quixotic mission. According to Álvaro Tarfe, where did he last see the other Don Quixote? A. In a mental hospital in Toledo. B. In a treehouse in Oviedo. C. In a brothel in Segovia. Correct answer, in a mental hospital in Toledo. What is going on here? One way of thinking about this chapter is to relate the legal maneuvering to the issue of Sancho's lashes. In this way, Cervantes signals to us that the contractual solution to the problem of how to distinguish work from slavery is what makes his novel superior to Avellaneda's. Thus, when Sancho mentions his lashes, Tarfe is oblivious. I don't understand that part about lashes, he says. Similarly, Sancho completes what the narrator variously refers to as his penitence, sacrifice, and labor without any harm to himself. On their surface, these details are explicable. Tarfe doesn't know the events of Cervantes' novel, and Sancho tricks his master by lashing trees. But for readers familiar with The Golden Ass, as well as El Lazario de Tormes, the transformation of the brutality of slavery into a civilized and humane labor contract is precisely the point of the novel form. Chapter 72's final trajectory confirms this bourgeois moral whereby Don Quixote must consent to pay his servant. They climbed up a hill from which they beheld their village. Sancho's odd apostrophe to their homeland is filled with contradictions that contain ironic indications of the new economic arrangement. Open your eyes, beloved homeland, and see that your son Sancho Panza returns to you, if not very rich, then very lashed. Open your arms and also receive your son Don Quixote, who, if he returns defeated by the arms of another, he also returns victorious over himself, which, as he has told me, is the greatest victory one can desire. I bring money, because if they gave me a good lashing, at least I went away on a horse. Notice how Sancho calls himself poor, but then rich, and how his last comment requires us to think yet again about his magical ass. Notice also the Christian and philosophical theme of the defeat of the self. That's all for now. Keep reading. The story only gets better as it ends. 
If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.